Shalom everyone, and we are going to study today about Parashat Pinchas. Uh, Parashat Pinchas is known about from the Zohar that it is the main parasha about healing. However, we go into the text itself in the, uh, the parasha, in the uh, Torah itself, it doesn't speak about healing. The, the Zohar about healing, it's a few hundred pages, and some of them, like, there's so many pages about the different organs of the body, about what brings a disease, how can you cure, and stuff like this. It's amazing. Why is Parashat Pinchas dealing with cures and healing, and especially in the month of cancer, right? which is another name for one of the most scariest diseases. Okay, so uh, we know we have to remember one very important thing. We are right now, uh, as we enter the month of cancer, and including especially the first half of the month of Leo, in one of the most dangerous periods of the year. And we spoke about it when we learn about the month of uh, Tammuz, the month of cancer, that this is the most dangerous time of the year because there are three months, especially this, these ones, and there is no protection. There's a, and also another, another expression of it is there are many, many judgments. There's no protection from the judgments. So our question is, Basically, why do we have so many judgments? Why do we have judgments in the first place? We know the world has a lot of judgments. Like, why was the world created with so many judgments? Why there's so many, so much negativity? And what's our share in that? And especially uh, how do we deal with this issue of the energy of negativities? We spoke about it last week and the week before. And here we have another parasha that is dealing with basically how do we overcome judgments and transform them into something of value, positive value. That is basically the main issue of this week, and especially Parashat Pinchas always aligns with the beginning of the three weeks of judgments, and this time it's going to be in a week from today, a week from, uh, which means just the Sunday after Shabbat Pinchas in Israel, that's going to be the beginning of the three weeks. Okay, so, uh, oh, you know, the truth is it's going to be on Shabbat, the 17th of Tammuz, um, the, the beginning of the three weeks is going to fall on Shabbat. That is the day of the, goal, the sin of the golden calf. So we have a lot of judgments. And the question is, how do we relate to judgments? Everybody experiences judgments. Judgments, how do you understand, how do we understand the meaning of judgments? So there are many uh, ways Kabbalistically to approach the understanding of judgments. On the shallow level, judgment means discomfort. Why? Things do not happen properly. That's usually when you say judgment means, you know, it's not comfortable, things do not flow, there are troubles, there are pains, aches, uh, all kinds of uh, disappointments, this is, that's all the fault of judgments. And our question is, Kabbalistically, when we go deeper, what does it mean, judgments? How do we understand the core of judgments? This is the basics. So first of all, if you noticed, we ju I just said that during, during the, this era, this part of the year, which means Tammuz, and the beginning of Av, there are many parashot that we read, and those parashot aligned 
with this time of the year, they have healing properties. And that goes with our sages teaching us that everywhere, Hashem Hikdim Trufala Maka. The Creator gives us always the remedy together with the plague. Which means if you want, and it's not just about diseases. Whenever we find ourselves into a big trouble, just look around and you will find the remedy to the trouble, the solution. Somewhere just around you, that's always correct. Always the Creator gives you the remedy and the solution just next to the problem and the judgments and the trouble. And why is it like this? We have to understand that we do not live in a world of judgments because the world did not start with judgments. The world starts with what? When we talk about Kabbalistically, the creation, we are talking about Keter. Keter, which is the top of the tree of life, the beginning of everything. What is the definition of Keter? This is the seed, the source of all the emanations that will follow of the tree of life all the way down to Malchut manifestation. But we know nothing can manifest, nothing can evolve from the source without it being included in the source. Which means, if we're talking about the Keter as the source and the Keter has one definition, it's all for the good. Which means, what is the source, the cause, the concept, the purpose of the creation? It is to share the endless light of the Creator with its creation. This is the source, which means everything comes from the source and nothing can evolve that is not included in the source. We have to remember that clearly because that is one key code for deciphering all the enigmas of life. You know, a lot of people go through stuff and they say, why me? Why is it happening? Where is justice? It's like, how come I get it and not them? You know, there's all kinds of expressions of people, not all of them quite spiritual, but since we are not perfect, we do have those kinds of questions. We do, we do have those kinds of thoughts. Okay? So again, where is this coming from? Why things are not fair? So many things. And if God is the only power running the show, uh, why many times you look at the show and the show is so, looks so godless? And you ask yourself, where was God when? And where is God now when so many atrocities are happening while we speak just on earth right now? In individual level, in so many places and, you know, globally. And the answer we have to remember, and this answer is the seed, like really the seed, the core of not just deciphering reality, but also to heal. And I'll explain. If we understand that everything is coming from the Keter, the, the first Sephira of the Tree of Life, Keter means it is the seed and the source. And if the Keter includes the, the meaning, the, pers the, the, the purpose of creation, the meaning and the purpose of creation is giving the endless light, pleasure, love, and bliss to someone who can appreciate it. However, since we have to remember, since the expansion and the sharing of all of that light happens endlessly from the Creator, from the Endless, okay? So Keter is emerging from the Endless, 
And that means that it concludes, includes everything. And what does it mean everything? When it says in Genesis chapter 1 that Adam was created in the image of God. And we know that God has no physical image because, you know, the endless has no physical image. And we, there's no way that our imagination and thoughts can somehow uh, define what, where, and how is God. Because he's endless. Okay? So we're talking about there was some kind of a mental image imprinted in every creature, in every soul, which is the basic of every, the, the story of the creation. And we learn that this, that imprint is the need, the desire to, to be like the creator, which means, what does it mean to be like the creator, the image of the creator? To be independent, which means you can never find needy, happy people because they are not independent. It's very impos it's Im impossible to find addictive, happy people. Why? Because their happiness is conditioned by a material, a person, uh, a, a status, something that the physical world can supply to you the moment you develop, and we all develop, addictions, that means that we are away from being independent, and that's where we have to look for our healing. Which means when we become independent, we'll find our true satiating happiness, not just a momentary one that comes and goes. Okay, and that has to be really understood, and that's coming from the Keter. Now, another aspect is creativity. And which means having challenges, solving the challenges, overcoming the challenges, and so on. And the third one is being a sharing person. I never met happy, selfish people. Okay? So now, because of that, if we were imprinted with that need to become like the Creator, we needed a universe that is imperfect so we can use challenges and those challenges some of them it's called judgments so where are the judgments coming from they're coming from the keter because if the purpose of the creation is to give pleasure and fulfillment and bliss to every creature Within it, it's already built in the idea that you need to earn it so you can, by overcoming challenges, we attain the image of the Creator and therefore, when we achieve real, true bliss and happiness, it's now attained and it belongs to us. We are the whole creators of that fulfillment. Therefore, we need to overcome the obstacles, the delays, and all what we call judgments. So the judgments are basically, they must, we must understand, brainwash ourselves again and again, that all those challenges, all those things that look like our enemies, they are not there to spite us, they are there to give us the ability to create a miracle. So, in Hebrew, the word for a test is nisayon. As we read the beginning of the story of the binding of Isaac, Elohim nisa et Avraham. So, the simple, uh, the simple uh, translation is God tested Abraham. However, that is not because the test is something that you need uh, the teacher needs to test the student in order to see if they if the student has the ability uh, or, or and the uh, amount of knowledge needed however here god does not need it it's so it's not a test it is a nisayon which means nisa gave him a challenge 
so he can overcome the challenge and acquire a miracle. What is a miracle? Nes, nisayon, nes, which means when we overcome the challenge, like in sports, like anything in life, we acquire a higher status. Now this status is outside of the previous box, but it is earned by us and it is really, truly ours. So this is the concept. So we have to understand that the concept of judgments, that this part of the year is full with them, not that there are no judgments along the rest of the year, but they, it's more concentrated during this time. So, of course, the remedy for that will be, as we said, we, let's say we learn in Parashat Chukat about the red heifer. And we learn that the red heifer is coming from the, the concept of the ox as a symbol of judgments. And the female of the ox is the cow, the heifer. So it's a judgment of judgment. And then it's a red one, which is another symbol of judgment. So we have triple judgment, and that we use that judgment by burning it to create a remedy, a vaccination against anything of death, death, which is the highest form of judgment that blocks the flow of life. So again, you use judgment as a remedy against death, okay? What can be more clear than that? Which means when people go through a lot of challenges, they can react in two different ways. One way is being annoyed, upset, disappointed, and that means they're missing the point. They're missing the, whole, the story. The story of our lives is that we're not supposed to have it easy, comfortable, and without any surprises, okay? Our life, when we live a life like this, when we try to ensure life without surprises, all, all research shows it is deadly. Okay, I spoke about it a few times when there was this, uh, this uh, uh, research a few decades ago about trying to create a mouse utopia and that creating a big, big place that is big for thousands of mice to multiply. They had enough space, enough food, enough drinks, enough places to breed and to raise the kid, the, the little ones and so on. And so they multiplied and multiplied. But when they came to a certain amount of mice, they started to decay. They started to have a kind of, they lost the will to live and they started to commit suicide, which means they simply lost the will to live. Mice, okay? And in few times they tried to do the same test again and again. And in all of those times, by certain few years of like mice Garden of Eden, mice utopia, the last mouse died. Simply they lost fertility, they lost the ability, their desire to protect their, their offspring, to protect their families and to even multiply. And that's what is. Which means we humans, we need, we need judgments. We need obstacles. We need challenges in order to grow. So either they will come from the outside as Rabbi Ashla calls it, the road of, um, of suffering, or, which means you run away from pain, therefore you start reinventing yourself. Or you can do it with less pain by setting high levels of spiritual growth, which is called the road of Torah, in which you're running after higher challenges of self spiritual growth you take commitments you really try to improve yourself so there are two ways a person can grow either running away from something or running after the two ways you can live your life either you become somebody else's food 
or you're just chasing after your own food. Okay, so it's like that's how this world is structured. So we can use the diversity of this universe, all the shades and the darkness of this universe, in order to improve ourselves and to re re acknowledge the image of the Creator within each one of us. So that's our discovery, and that is basically the process of reinvention that humanity have to grow through in order to achieve the grand final tikkun, tikkun, the correction. So when we go through judgments, we have to understand we can look at the judgments as tools given to us, presented to us as a present by the Creator so we can acquire our own godliness by overcoming the challenges, okay? That is the spiritual growth. And therefore, the word in Hebrew for spirit, spirit, ruach, means also moving forward, going up in the Kabbalistic language and overcoming, never being reactive, always being proactive, taking things in the broader idea of I'm here in a special training program. It's called human life. And whatever is happening for me, to me, it is not happening by chance. It is happening to give me the ability to grow, overcome, recreate myself, reinvent myself till finally I find the image of God that is within me. Now, that is the source of healing. Uh, any kind of, of issues, uh, financial issues, mental issues, uh, and, and body, like health issues. It's all about that concept. Now, if we choose to become victims, which means we just curse the judgments, we complain about the judgments, we become the judgments, and we flow with the judgments, then we're basically making it worse. And Rabbi Zakhloria, as I said many times, says it can go on for 30 lifetimes that you play the victim, you just let the suffering overcome you, you become the problem, you become the suffering, the misery, and the disease because you associate yourself with that aspect of negativity till your soul cannot bear anymore because there's so much suffering. And then finally, after who knows how many years, how many lifetimes, you will change direction and you simply take upon yourself never to be a victim again. So either it happens to you passively and the amount of pain, misery, and suffering we just go bigger and bigger and bigger till you give it up. Because, you know, being miserable, being a victim, it is for free. You do not need to invest anything in it. You just have to cooperate with that. However, the more, what with that, what is more is more. The more negativity you get, the more pain, misery you get. Till you realize that that is not any way you want to go anymore. And you're accepting that from now on, you're going to fight and overcome the negativity because that's not an option. Okay, so either passively you go through 30 lifetimes till you let go of being a victim or proactively you develop a spiritual concept, a spiritual idea of basically realizing that even the judgment is coming originally from the high kettle and that is our choice and chance to move up the scale and to evolve into the human being the great human being that each one of us is supposed to evolve to okay now how do we see it in parashat pinchas and as i said before parashat pinchas does not speak in the text itself you find nothing about healing but you find a lot about judgments. So, Parashat Pinchas, as a story, 
continues the story of Parashat Balak. And in Parashat Balak, we uh, defined three types of human beings. The first one was Balak. Balak, the king of Moab, a great sorcerer, wizard of the dark arts, uh, that he saw in his crystal ball, kind of crystal ball, he didn't use crystal ball, he used another magic, but it doesn't matter. He saw, he saw stuff that regular human beings do not see. He, had, he was a clairvoyant. He saw the power of Moses and the Israelites. He saw that with their spiritual power, magical power, they overcame the kings of the Amorites, Sihon and Og, and they conquered the land of the Amorites from Moab all the way north to almost Damascus. Okay, huge part of, air, of land, okay, and he was afraid. He got really stressed out. So he asked Balaam to come and help Israel, help him to destroy the nation of Israel. However, he was a clairvoyant. He saw a big a picture, but he didn't see the whole picture, and that was his big mistake. He did not see, as we explained, that Moses got a very direct order not to touch the Moabites, which means Moses and the Israelites were not a threat whatsoever against Moab. He just wasted so much energy, so much time, and finally, in order to try to fight the Israelites, okay, and it was in vain. He did not know, which means we see those people that when you come from the place of fear, ego, negativity, which means it's self, um, you just live on other people's fear because the story is that he became the king of Moab because he was a big wizard of the dark arts, which means his position as a king, all his money and power was gained by fear. And we know till today, politicians make huge fortune, okay, politically, power and money out of other people's fear. That's the easiest way to get into power. But there's a big cost. The cost is always, it doesn't last. You fall very fast. You know, it will take maybe a year, two years, three years, but you will fall because you built on a concept that is fake. Okay, fear is fake. It's not real. It's nothing. It's all darkness. And darkness is nothing that, you, that has continuity. Okay, Balak reign did not linger because of his mistake, which means we have a lot of people that can see big stuff. They can play big and powerful, but they do not see the big picture. And although they see stuff, that is misleading because they came, they did not connect to the Keter. Their purpose was to hurt because they were afraid and they were into hurting. Same thing with Balaam. Balaam was a greater person than Balak. However, he wanted to see the truth. He got from above a message saying, stay out of it. And he could not stay out of it. What was the result? He was killed. Which means if he listened to the message, he did not listen to the message. Why did he not listen to the message? Because he wanted honor, money, and power more than he wanted to know the truth. Okay? Seeing the truth does not guarantee that you're going to make the right decision. The moment you, you let hatred, lust, pride to guide you, you will surely uh, pay dearly for that because even if you see the, 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 uh, the message written on the wall, you will not be able to use it properly because you're not committed for the truth, for honesty, and for humility. Okay, the third person in Parashat Balak was Pinchas. He saw big trouble coming out. He saw people dying by thousands. He did not go into hysteria. He did not get upset. 
He simply cared for how can I help. He was not a great person. He did not have a lot of honor. He was not nothing of that issue, but he was there to do what nobody else has tr tried to do because, because he cared. Because he cared and he really wanted to do what's good for others. He really wanted to do what the Creator wanted to do, which is to stop the pain and the killing. Therefore, he saw what Moses did not see. Because Moses was a little bit reactive in that scene. Because he took things personally. Okay, I won't go into the details. So Pinchas, he went ahead to solve the problem. He knew from looking at it, and he was, he was quite a wise guy, he even remembered what to do, and he learned it from who? From Moses. Moses was a teacher, and he forgot. Pinchas knew what to do because he heard it from Moses, but he did not lose his senses. He had a very strong sense, a sense of certainty that there is a problem, there is a solution, God does not want people to die and we have to stop and there must be a solution. The moment you're focused on the solution and not on the problem, you're focused on the light and not on the pain and the darkness, you will surely find it. That's how you get out of the box, by really connecting again to the Keter, which means what is God's desire in this situation? To kill people, to take a revenge, to bring pain, not in the kettle. So if you can connect to the true source, you will understand even the source that is beyond and behind the judgment. Pinchas overcame. He basically raised himself to a creative action. He went against the judgments. He created his own judgment. And he destroyed, he stopped the plague. He killed two people. But it was like, you know, like, a, like a, uh, sometimes, you know, when you treat somebody with any kind of a treatment in medicine, you have to stick a needle into a place, into the pus, in order to get it out. And it's very painful. This is judgment. But after that, the release of the pressure and the poison will bring relief. We know that the healing crisis is like, it's bad, it's, it's judgment. Somebody was smoking badly for years and he stopped smoking. Not just stopped smoking, he started to eat only healthy, light food. What will happen? His body will create a wave of judgment. It will come from the body and will push away all the poisons that have been uh, collected in the, in the body. Is that bad? No, yes and no. Yes, because it's very uncomfortable. Okay? No, because that's how you get rid of the poison and the only way of healing was to get rid of the poison, which means you have to allow the body to react and to create a terrible reaction from within of pushing the poisons out. The person will be terribly sick with sneezing and coughing and who knows what else. But that's how the body takes out the dirt. Finally, when you stop building in the uh, accumulation of poison, and you, the body gets a little bit of power to do what? To basically push away. What does it mean? It is judgment. The body is right now judging the poison, which means blocking it, pushing it away. So it's a reaction from the, from the vessel. And that reaction from the vessel to stop, block, delay what was there before, we call it judgment. So is it comfortable? No. Okay. But is it constructive? Yes. And therefore, this is the basic idea of what a miracle is about. It's about shifting 
from the passive aspect of receiving dirt, negativity, negative emotions, negative uh, forces, negative chemicals, anything that is negative, when we react and we push it away, this is also judgment. But this is a judgment that counter judges, like the red heifer ashes. It is a judgment that is built to counteract the other negativities. So it's a healing judgment. So how do you heal? You have to create judgment from within. You need to create healing fire from within. You need to heal to create excitement from within. So when a person wants to heal, one of the strongest remedies is get excited about your life, which means this is an arousal of energy, of excitement, of need, desire to do something good, something positive. What do you do with it? That's judgment because it is coming from below. How do we see that? Here it is, the story of Pinchas. And as we said, I'm going to read from the Zohar Parashat Pinchas about it. Pinchas, which is a person of a lot of love, a lot of positivity, a lot of spirituality. However, he realized there's a problem and this problem needs an action. So he needed to stop that negativity. So his action coming out of his comfort zone and moving into, do into doing something that is so much against his nature. Okay, because he knew it's the right thing to do. That is judgment, but it's a judgment that counters, counteracts the deadly judgments that brought thousands of people to death. So the Zohar says, I'm reading in the Zohar of Parashat Pinchas, verse 73. At the time the Pinchas was zealous. Now everybody knows that being zealous is involved with judgment. You cannot be zealous and sit, do nothing. Zealousy means that you care, you get aroused by that mentally, you get a lot of adrenaline, and you have to do something about it. Not all zealousy is bad. If the zealousy comes from out of rage, anger, hate, okay, that's bad zealousy. That will consume you like any inflammation. But this is a good zealousy. You do it in not because of hatred, you do it out of love. You do it not because of fear, but you do it out of devotion. And that's a big secret, says the Zohar. So when Pinchas was zealous, and he went among the crowds, says the Zohar, ונכנס בתוך המונים, והעלה את הנועפים על הרומח לעיני כל ישראל. He wanted so much to stop the plague, not because he wanted to kill somebody, but he knew the only way to stop it is to kill the two people who were at the time of an intercourse. And at, ten miracles happened at that moment, that he killed them in one hit of the spear. And he was not a warrior, that he had enough power to raise them up because he needed witnesses that everybody to see that were caught in the middle of that. There's so many miracles and, but then what happened when he saw that that was amongst the people of the tribe of Shimon. And the people of Shimon also represent zealousy and judgment. Shimon and Levi, they are the two brothers, sons of Jacob that killed the people of Shechem because of their zealousy for their sister that she was raped, okay? Uh, so he knew that those people have rage and they can kill him. Therefore, by the way, the, people, the tribe of Shimon never got their own uh, estate in the promised land. They were spread among the, the uh, cities of the tribe of Yehuda. Why? If they were all accumulated in the same place, that would be too dangerous. And therefore, Jacob and Moses, 
made sure that they, they, they do not get their own estate in the land of Israel, but they will be spread in order to simply dilute their judgment that they represent. Okay? So when he saw those people in rage because he killed their leader, Parcha Nishmato, he knew they're going to kill him, so he voluntarily took off. And he was really willing to die just for the sake of saving the rest of the nation. He did not do it because he wanted honor, respect, money, or any sympathy from anyone. He simply did the right thing. Okay? So, his soul left his body. And then, there are two great souls who were naked without a tikkun. These are the souls, Neshamot, Nadav Avihu. Basically, they were his two uncles that died 38 years earlier while the temple was dedicated. If you read Parashat Shmini in the book of Leviticus, Vaikra. So they, Nadav and Avihu, were two of the greatest souls ever incarnated into a physical body. Because he created such a level of devotion, he created an affinity with these two souls and they got into his body. Using his body to come back to earth to another life. And they included the soul of Pinchas with them and they brought it back. So although he died, clinical death, the souls of Nadav and Avihu came back bringing his soul back to his body. Now he woke up alive with three souls in him. Okay? Now he was such a great soul, he did not have a purpose of achieving greatness. But he did achieve greatness because he was not anointed as a Kohen, although his grandfather was Aaron, the high priest. He was already uh, grown up when Aaron and his sons were anointed to be the high priest. And he was not anointed because he was not Aaron, not his sons. Now, because of what he did, he created a new kind of a priest. Aaron was a priest because he had unconditional love and kindness. But you know what? Sometimes you need tough love. You need to involve some judgment if you really love somebody else. And sometimes the biggest love is by saying no. I cannot give you everything you want. Go and get it yourself. That's how you raise a child. That's how you, that's how you educate. Okay? Not by telling all the answers to your student. Just by guiding him or her how to go and find the answers by themselves. So that arousal from within to become independent, to achieve it on your own, comes from chesed involved with judgment. Abram, when we, came, we said about Abram, he had to go through a test, but it was not a test, it was a miracle. Abram thought that chesed is loving and kindness unconditionally without any, any uh, uh, difference. However, when he realized that he has to bind Isaac, who was uh, the embodiment of judgment, he realized that chesed, doing good, is not always about giving and being kind. It's sometimes you need to put some judgment inside the chesed for the chesed to be productive. And that means you need to do it from within. That is judgment. Okay, so that's very important for us to understand. So just being passive, you know, I'm just a nice person. Yeah, but what did you do in order to change yourself, your environment? How, when was it that you stepped up and took responsibility? Ah, you know, I'm just a nice person. will never say something uncomfortable to anyone. So you don't really care because if you care, you sometimes have to say no. You have to say, you know, I love you. However, that's not going to help you if I'm going to do it for you. 
I can guide you. With, that's, that is judgment. But that judgment, if you realize it's arousing something from within against what you always did before, being active instead of being passive, okay? This judgment, as we know, this is delay, okay? But just a second, if the universe is full of flow of endless love, if you want to treasure it, to contain it, how do you define a container? Conta container, something that contains, need to have judgment, needs to have any kinds of walls, and these walls delay the spread uh, of the bliss. That's how it becomes a treasure. If the treasure was whatever you put in the treasure of bliss, money, whatever, and then immediately, there's no limitation, so it flows all directions, it's not a treasure, okay? It is not a treasure. To treasure something means that you need a judgment, some walls to delay, to hold on, so it stays, so you have control over how to share it, how to give it away, and how to care with others, for others with it, okay? So judgment is not evil, it's not bad. We have to remember. That's why the whole thing of healing is so important to be acquired during those days of judgment in the summer, in the months of Cancer and Leo, of Tammuz and Av. Okay? So then, which means what did Pinchas do? He created a new form of Kohen. The oldest form was Aharon, unconditional love. Okay, now there's a higher form. It's unconditional love, but when it's needed, you need also to make a cut. Like the best physician can, with a lot of love, but sometimes you need to make a cut. You need to inflict some pain over the patients in order to heal the patients. Okay, that's a must. And if you cannot do that, you cannot be a physician. Okay, if you cannot stand other people's pain, can you work in a hospital? Can you really treat a patient? Of course not. Okay, and by the way, you need to be not nice sometimes and tell the patient, you know, uh, tell me about your lifestyle. And you have to say, although it's not comfortable, you have some terrible uh, customs that you have, you must change them, habits that you have to change even though you're very angry about it, if you have this kind of problem, if you continue to eat fatty food, it's going to hurt you terribly. Yeah, but I love mayonnaise. I love fried food. What would I do without french fries? What would I do without fat meat? Okay, my life is not a life. Uh, you want to live, you have to stay out of those, those kind of foods. Oh, you have to stay out of being angry, of being upset, of being judgmental, because that makes you sick. This is what Azor is teaching us. You know, when you create an inflammation, mental inflammation that is coming from anger, then you infl inflammate your liver and then your heart. That can become really poisonous for you. And that will inflammate uh, the liver and the heart create a lot of, the Zohar says, a lot of cholesterols, and then you will have inflammation of the arteries, and that will block the arteries, but they're not coming by themselves. You know, people can eat like fatty food, whatever, but if they are nice, loving, kind people, they don't have the tendency to create a coronary disease as people who are full of anger and uh, you know, and hatred. It's all about arousing that issue. So let's see how we can learn about it. So we see it. So in the parasha, the beginning of parasha Pinchas is talking about the zealousy of Pinchas and how he transformed himself and a small letter U that's being added to his name 
because he's not the same person as he had been. He really transformed himself. He transformed himself, and then the small letter Yud, and the Zohar says, small letter Yud is Malchut. And what is Malchut? A vessel. The ability to contain. If it does not contain, it's not holding the bliss. If it's not containment, there is no growth. Okay? And that's a small letter Yud in his name. Later on, he transformed even farther. And his name was totally changed. And we know him later on as Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah, the prophet, which the Talmud is saying, and the Zohar is saying, and many other places, the Midrashim, that Elijah the prophet is basically Pinchas. He became so elevated that he became an angel, and we know Pinchas never died. When it says, I give him an internal eternal covenant he never died he just went to heaven in a chariot of fire and elijah the prophet is still amongst us in times that we need so there's so many stories about elijah the prophet appearing in times of need for instance when rabbi shimon was in the cave for 13 years who appeared every day to teach him the zohar elijah the prophet you can see a lot of great Kabbalists right in the just on the front page of the book it says this is the book that wrote that great Kabbalist with together with Elijah the prophet Rabbi Isaac Luria it's written in front the front page of every book of his that he wrote what he wrote or studied or brought together with Elijah the prophet it was real revealed to him what if I'm not a great Kabbalist okay Elijah the prophet appears in every ceremony of Brit Milah, circumcision. Okay? What was Pinchas zealous about? About the covenant that the people were breaking. Okay? So he became Malach Habrit, the angel of the covenant. He appears in every Brit Milah ceremony. Whenever you put a chair and you say, this is the chair for Elijah the prophet, for Eliyahu Hanavi. And he comes. So if you've been to a Jewish ceremony of circumcision and they put the chair, you know who's coming to the ceremony. You've been together in a ceremony with Elijah the prophet. What about the Seder night when we put the fifth cup and we invite Elijah the prophet again to help us to move forward with that miracle of Exodus that we have to experience every year all over again during the Seder night. So there are many, many miracles appearing in Parashat Pinchas, and that's the extra yud over here. And then I give him his, my covenant, Shalom. And Shalom means completion, wholeness. But there is a cut in the letter Vav, in the word Shalom. And that cut shows there's no completion. And from that place of no completion, we have to create the completion. Because what is Shalom? It's about we can't be without each other. So the right column, Chesed, is not really working without the left column, Judgment. Okay? And then we have another anomaly in the parasha. That's in chapter 26, verse 1. Vahi achri magifa, And it was after the plague. And then there is a whole space in the middle of the verse that does not ever appear anywhere else in the Torah. That there is a space and starting of a new line. Why? Because in that space there's a lot of white light. That is what Pinchas did. How do you stop the plague? You bring in the light. Okay? So then, how does the story continue? And Moses speaks to the Israelites. Uh, and basically, he does another census. 
It's almost 40 years they didn't do a census. And we learned before what's the census about. It's not about counting how many are they, but in, in order to appoint every person to his duty. That's how you achieve shalom, completion, by every person knowing his duty, his, his position in the true seeking towards correction of humanity. Okay? And then that goes on. And this is also in a way judgment. Why are you judging me? Of course, you're not like me. We're not the same. It doesn't mean we're not conflicting each other, but we cannot be the same. Why? As the sages are saying, the same way people's faces are not the same, the same way their nature and thoughts are not the same, and their calling is not the same. So if everybody will be a carpenter, who will do the dishes? If everybody will be uh, seamstresses, who will lead? Okay, if everybody will try to lead, who will be the farmers? So we have to understand that every person has his own part in the creation of the completion of humanity. And the fact that we are different from each other, that's no judgment. It is judgment because it's separating ourselves from each other by saying, I'm not like you, you're not like me. But it's a positive judgment. Without that separation, we will never be who we're supposed to be. And he cannot uh, basically erase all the differences among people. You have to develop the special talent of, in every person. And then comes another weird story that it looks like, what is that doing over here? And that, uh, chapter 27, verse 1. Vatikavna bnot Tzlofchad, ben Hefer ben Gilad ben Machir. And the daughters of Tzlofchad came uh, to Moses. And their names are Machla, Noah, Vechogla, Umalka, Vetilza. Five, why do we have to know all the names? Okay? And they came and they say, our father died in the desert. He had only daughters. Okay? Now we are going to divide the land. Every person will get an estate in the promised land. But because we do not have men in our family, what, what about us? You know, what about us? How are we going to, we just have to marry other men and to, what about our father's share? Moses has no idea. Verse 5, and Moses brings their judgment in front of Hashem. But the word Mishpatan is very special. The last letter, the final Nun, is a big Nun. That's probably the longest letter in the whole five books of Moses. It's a big Nun. And Nun means judgment. Again. Okay, so what is that? What's, what about that? So, and God answered Moses saying, reading verse 6, Ken bnot Slovchad dovot. The daughters of Slochad, of Slovchad, they are right. Which means the fact that they awakened, aroused themselves, got out of the comfort zone, say, oh, I'm a victim. We, our father died. We have no brothers. You know, what are we? Chopped liver? Uh, probably yes, because we are women. We have no rights. We live in a world that women have no rights. So what can we do about it? Do you understand? You have to go. You're not a victim. And they come to Moses and says, we are not victims. Ask the Creator. And Moses' answer is not, oh, go away, women. We don't care about you. He's asking the Creator. And the Creator is saying they are right. The fact that they aroused five of them. How many basic judgments come from the upper worlds? Five judgments. These are the five daughters of Tzlovchad. Five judgments. Which means, many times, we have to go against a passive nature that I'm a victim, I don't deserve, who am I, I'm nothing, I'm a nobody, and so on. And in order to get God's bliss and gift, I have to arouse myself. That's judgment. And say, what about me? What, what does it mean? God does not want me to have 
happiness, bliss, and whatever is good? Of course he wants. But if I'm not going to create the judgment of, I deserve it, I will never get it. That's how we spoke about a container. A container has walls and uh, a bottom that delay the spreading of whatever it contains. Otherwise, it's not a container. Okay? We have to create the container and that goes against, no, who am I? I'm a nobody. I don't deserve. And to create a judgment, positive one. I do deserve to be a vessel for God's light. I do deserve to be a vessel that will contain healing, happiness, and completion. And therefore, I stand up for myself. That's, and what God is saying, they did the right thing. Okay, there are girls. So what is, so the question is, if a man dies and he has no sons, his daughters inherit, okay, the estates. And it goes on to the judge, it doesn't matter, but the point is, they were right. Asking for their rights, it's always right to ask for your rights. Not from a place of anger. If you come from a place of anger, that's a bad judgment. That's not a vessel. How, how come? It cannot contain. You know, when it comes from, I really want, I really want to have more, that's a vessel. When you come from anger, you don't want more. You're just upset. You're being annoyed. So what you're focusing on? On the pain. On the annoyance. That's not a vessel for bliss. So complainers are never winners. They're never achievers. Have you noticed that? Okay. So the daughters of Tzlovchad, they show us how to, how to stand for yourself, but from the place that why do you think? Well, God doesn't want to give me? Of course he wants to give me. So I'm coming to take what is mine because God gave it to me. That's judgment. Okay. Now we have the appointing of Joshua to become the heir of Moses. And that's again taking somebody, you know, we have to have humility. If we have to have humility, which means it's better that we live you know, in, a, in dirt, uh, having nothing, just sleeping under a tree, and so on, then we'll be one with God. You know, a lot of people really think that that's the way. No, it's not the way. Being a leader means you have to rise above everybody else. You have to say, yes, I can, I should, I am, and you have to stand up and step up to the plate. And that is also judgment, okay? which means it's enlarging the vessel of, well, I'm supposed to do that. Yes, I am. That means also. And then chapter 28 to, till the end, we learn about all the holidays again. In Parashat Emor, in the book of Vaikra, we had already a list of the holidays. We have them again over here to show that we have to reenact them before we co go into the Holy Land. Because, and because, so nobody will think it just, when Moses was the leader, we would celebrate all of those great celebrations. No, even after Moses got going away, we still deserve to have the same holidays. So of course, there are a lot of issues in this parasha. I just finished with the, with the part that I have always to read. Uh, because it speaks about the whole meaning of it. And it says, Adehavo Azlei, that's in Pinchas Asulam, commentary, verse 386. Adehavo Azlei, Atan They were walking, Rabbi Shimon and his students, and there came a great eagle. Aschar al and the eagle made circles around, you know, like eagles do, above their heads. They came out and he was like standing there, floating on air waves, air uh, flow, like, you know, like eagles do. Amar Rabbi Pinchas, Vadai idan diruta huashta. Rabbi Pinchas said, that means if the, if the eagle is there, it's a time of good willing. What does it mean, time of good willing? 
time of good willing is Kabbalistically, it's a big, big secret. It's the time that we turn around the judgment, the aspect of delay on the negative aspect, of the pain aspect, of the discomfort aspect. When we raise our mind to a true faith in the good, that it's all coming from the Creator, we can transform any negativity and pain and judgment into good willing okay good willing which means what's the purpose when we raise our consciousness into truly faith in god's sharing and i know that there is nothing but god and also what i'm going through is just for me to stop blocking the flow and stop losing the bliss. So that's called that called idan reuta. Et ratzon in Hebrew idan reuta in Aramaic. Et ratzon is the point that when you get there, you will achieve healing, physical healing, business healing. Every that's the place again to connect to the original will of the Creator to share with us. When we are in distress and upset and anger and fear, we are not connected to the, that, mo that place, that frequency. When we change our frequency to a place that we really connect to God's desire unconditionally to share with us, then everything can be simply healed. Exactly on that moment, the gates of mercy open up. Lechol inun beimare to everyone who's on a deathbed. Vehu zimnal asvatalon. That's the time, which means when is time of good willing. So, if you look at the of the prayers of the Hebrew prayer book, but the the time that is called the time of good willing is the time of mincha of Shabbat, which means Shabbat afternoon and the afternoon prayer and the third meal okay so but anytime a person is connecting to that frequency that is called etrazon it will become mercy and healing and what's the symbol for that the eagle the eagle is a symbol of healing why let's go back to the chariot of ezekiel we said chesed, the symbol for chesed is the lion. The symbol for judgment, gvura, is the ox. Therefore, the female of the ox is judgment of judgment. And the red heifer is triple judgment. What's the central column? That's the eagle. So when the eagle appears, it means the right and the left settle down. And now they merge together. And now the judgment has been converted to be a healing judgment. It's not a delay in a bad sense that you don't get the good stuff that you're supposed to get, but a delay, delay in a good aspect that all what you receive from the Creator is being delayed so you can treasure it and keep it in your life. Okay? That is really the secret. When we overcome our negativities and fears, and we change it to returning light. Instead of, I want it easy and fulfilling and right now, without any delay, that's selfish desire to receive for oneself alone. That will always inflammate the problem, even worse. But when we say, I cannot just have it for myself, I'm, I understand that the Creator wants to give me something bigger. So I cannot receive if I don't make sure that others receive it. I create a judgment. I create a curtain, as the Kabbalists are calling it. Masach. I push back so others can have it too. And that Masach, the judgment that I created, becomes the treasure, the, the vessel to receive the bliss and the healing. If you're busy when you have problems, just 
with the stress and the feeling that you're being cheated out of your whatever rights and something like he's so busy with I want I want I need it should be mine and so on then it will be inflammated but the moment you turn it around and you connect to the desire of the creator to share with you and you share and you behave on the same wavelength, wavelength and volunteer and do for others you create a judgment you turn around you stop the me 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 and you put judgment on it you heal it by transforming it so it is a judgment it is a curtain a massage you push back doing something for others is pushing back is you apply judgment on your own judgment that will create the vessel the delay that we can hold on the faith in the good allows us to be sharing and generous that creates the returning light that is basically the only force that is a judgment it's our judgment we stop our in, in, uh, innate desire to hold on everything for ourselves and that will inflammate everything and we judge it by giving sharing caring and loving for others because we connect to that good willing of the creator and we trust him and love him and have faith in him that will become that judgment will become what is called the central column or the eagle now it can contain the bliss because I'm receiving in order to give the instinct is to hold it on for myself what's the problem just remember most of ball games that we know the moment you hold on to the ball it's going to be taken away from you right so the only way to keep it and to keep the victory going on is give hand over the ball to another member of your group or move it to forward like in tennis ping pong whatever you have to hit to hit the ball you cannot keep the ball you have to hit the ball that's a judgment you have to hit it just move it forward one game like american uh, uh, football it, you can hold on to the ball but then everybody is allowed to beat you up okay that's basically how life is about you want to hold everything for yourself you'll be beaten up you want the victory to continue and to flow you have to push it away hand it over move it on that is the judgment that you arouse from within and that will be the healing the symbol of the healing is the ego it continues later on on verse 392 while they were sitting the eagle came back to them to them again with a big rose in his beak and he threw the rose in front of them and went away they saw it and they were happy what is that rose and he said that was a special rose the rose with 13 petals what is the 13 petals of the rose the 13 attributes of mercy where are they coming from from that level in the tree of life in the Keter that is called the the good willing from there the 13 attributes of mercy coming in down when when we really have that trust when we raise our consciousness from our pain and sorrow and lust and needs and we raise it all the way up to the kettle to the place of good willing that's how much the creator wants to share with us when we bring it back now it comes in 13 paths that are called the 13 uh, attributes that are also called the 13 petals of the rose all of these symbols it's all about the secret of healing that we need so much all of our society we cannot be even if you're right don't be angry about anybody else even if you're being attacked 
anger is not going to protect you. Even if you're being wrong, you know, somebody you see wrongdoings, hatred, upset is just going to inflammate your arteries. There's no holy anger. There's only holy love, holy good willing. And when we connect to that in, in spite of so much judgment, and you look around, there is so much anger in the media. There's so much anger everywhere. There's so much violence in movies. And it looks like it's a violence of the good guys against the bad guys. It will never solve the problem. The first thing, yes, Pinchas was violent. He killed two people. He, but he did it not from hatred, not from anger. He did it from good willing. He did it just because he wanted to stop the killing. If it, if he came, if he did it out of anger, and 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 hatred, he, that would not achieve the goal of stopping the plague. We have really to keep our minds and hearts clean from so much anger that it's so much around us, and that anger, the more it is excited, it creates more negativity, more wars. We already see hundreds of people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people already being uh, killed or wounded in Eastern Europe right now. It's, that's judgment. Why? Because it was inflammation of hatred that nobody wanted to stop. It was all about who is right. It can't be angry and right at the same time. It's not that place. And the rest of the world is influenced because the world, the rest of the world cooperated with it. And the rest of the world, the world is still being busy, being right and being upset and angry about. And, and you see the instigation of anger in political uh, issues and in the media. Do not cooperate, do not support it, do not consume it, do not be part of it. It is wrong. Rightist and leftist, it doesn't matter the moment it's anger and hatred, it's wrong. It's the same thing. It's cooperating with the dark side. We need, but being like, oh, we have to, you know, turn the other cheek and just love and just love, unconditional love, don't judge anybody else, that's also foolish. You have to arouse yourself. And you have to get up and stand for your rights and stop the judgment, stop the hatred with positivity. And that will heal, first of all, ourselves and then our society. Thank you so much and have a great week.